Hello, everybody, and welcome back again to our Evicted by Greed conference on global finance, housing and resistance. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us for this second panel of today. And this panel will be about foggy properties and golden sands, money laundering in London and Dubai. And we have a speaker, Sam Leon of Global Witness and Karina Shadrovsky of OCCRP. But first of all, I will briefly introduce our moderator for today. So the panel will be moderated by Rima Schaier. And she leads the outreach and localization efforts at the Hermes Center for Transparency and Digital Human Rights. And there she manages and contributes to projects that support NGOs, media, and investigative journalists to create secure whistleblowing platforms. And she has been active in various Tunisian and international human rights NGOs with a focus on youth empowerment, citizen journalism, and the use of technology for social change. And she's also the program manager of the Digital Whistleblowing Fund. And in this fund, investigative journalism groups and human rights organizations can apply to receive financial, operational and strategic support if they want to start a secure digital whistleblowing initiative. So just to remind you how it works today, so you can participate via the chat, which you can access to our website and you can post there any comments or questions. And it's great if you can post your questions during the talks. So we will collect them and post them at the end for the Q&A. Um, and also, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat and say something about uh, who you are and why you're interested to join today, that's also really nice. And um, yeah, a final comment, the video contributions uh, of the panelists that were filmed before today, they're all accessible through a special website that we set up which we will also share with you in the chat. So you can always go there to watch the, the background contributions that were filmed beforehand. So handing over to you, uh, Rima. Thank you, uh, Lika, and thank you so much, uh, the Disruption, Disruption Lab, for hosting such an important conversation. Uh, today, our panel is about foggy properties uh, and golden sands, money laundering in London and Dubai, uh, with Karina from OCCRP and Sam from Global Witness. And in this panel, we will uh, together investigate and analyze how money laundering, organized crime, and corruption interfere fear and influence real estate, addressing the context of uh, London and Dubai. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Sam. Uh, Sam Leon has worked on numerous campaigns at Global Witness and has pioneered the use of digital investigation techniques since 2016. His work focuses on using public available and leaked uh, data to expose corruption. Recent projects include an investigation into money laundering at the Trump Ocean Club, Panama, and analysis uh, of the corruption risk posed by anonymously owned homes in London, which he will talk uh, about today. And yeah, uh, Sam, I give to you the floor uh, if you would like to tell us more about Global Witness and what you're doing there. Thanks a lot, Rima, and, and it's great. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, today to make an intervention on such a important topic. I feel one of the most important um, topics um, in UK, uh, the Europe and, and Europe and worldwide. So um, as Rima said, I work for an organization called Global Witness. We've been going for just over 20 years now. Our work um, focuses on uh, corruption, human rights abuses, and increasingly environmental destruction and the risk um, to us all posed by climate change. Um, I head up our digital or data investigations team, so supporting our kind of broad range of investigative journalists and campaigners uh, to work with digital sources, whether or not that's um, leaked databases or um, social media information or other publicly available data. Um, but ha perhaps sort of most importantly about my background, I, I'm from London and I still live in the city and it's, and it's really, really hard, I think, generally to have a conversation about um, housing and housing crises and the risks posed by um, offshore capital um, without talking about the UK and about London in particular, because London suffers from kind of one of the worst and acute and protracted forms of housing crisis, um, along with all the sort of soci all the associated kind of social ailments, um, such as kind of wealth inequality, homelessness and in-work poverty. Um, Property in London is, I think, 
everyone's probably familiar is is, is hugely expensive. Um, recent research shows that um, on average, millennials uh, spend about uh, one third of their income on rent. Um, and the price of land itself uh, has risen by over five times in the last 25 years, of course, completely outstripping uh, the rate at which incomes have grown. And what are the consequences? Well, we have 3.6 million people living in overcrowded homes here and 400,000 people homeless or at risk of homelessness. And London, uh, the capital of the UK, is being sort of hollowed out by the divisions that this inflicts on those who rent property and those who own property. And of course, this situation is by no means unique to London. And I know uh, across this weekend, uh, many other panelists are going to talk about their specific experience and the uh, local environment they have there. Um, there are many reasons why housing is so expensive in London. Lack of social and public housing relative to demand, inflexible rules for development. But one of the major curses, and I think that's sort of at the heart of um, what we're speaking about this conference, is the treatment of housing as a speculative asset, first and foremost, um, not as a place for shelter, dignity and safety, but primarily as a, as a piggy bank, something that year on year um, accrues value um, and that incentivizes uh, hoarding. So one in 10 British adults now owns more than one home. So for those who can afford to own property, um, we found like a greater sort of concentration of ownership of property in their hands. And foreign investors are sort of a huge part of this picture too. The annual amount of overseas finance in the UK um, housing market has risen from over six billion pounds per year um, a decade ago to 32 billion pounds um, by 2014. And this amounts to 17% of all foreign direct investment in the UK. These trends, which see property as a financial asset and concentrate in a few hands of a trench to divide between those who are able to profit um, from the rise, um, from the rise in prices, and those who rent, whose incomes are just completely and continuously eroded by rising house prices. And Global Witness has attacked one dimension of this problem, which I think speaks to what the panel are going to be talking about today, and that's the offshore ownership of property. Because many sort of foreign and domestic buyers of property opt not just to own it through a foreign company, but through a foreign company registered in, in an offshore tax haven uh, like the British Virgin Islands, where tax rates are rock bottom, often zero, and there's little to no transparency as to who actually controls those companies. And so, of course, offshore ownership of property is a contributor towards inequality. It boosts profits for those lucky enough to own land um, and limits the effect of domestic uh, tax policy to redistribute profits drawn from speculation around property. Um, according to our recent research, um, about 87,000 properties are currently held offshore in England and Wales. And we estimate, and this is a really kind of low bar estimate because um, many of these properties uh, are part of larger commercial deals and, and have sort of artificially low prices. And we estimate that's about 100 billion worth, 100 billion pounds. Um, re research commissioned by the London Mayor found that sort of foreign buyers bought sort of 3,600 of London's newly built homes, um, 28,000 newly built homes between 2014 and 16, um, and 70% of these were used as kind of uh, rental investments. And until fairly recently, there was a raft of sort of tax loopholes associated with owning property through offshore companies. Uh, um, in the UK, you could reduce your inheritance tax bill, and when you died, you could eliminate capital gains, um, sorry, eliminate inheritance tax, and you could eliminate capital gains tax. Um, and these, these loopholes are, of course, typical, typical of the functioning of offshore. Um, it allows those with the means to skirt the laws set by a democratically elected government in order to increase profits and avoid scrutiny. Some of these loopholes are now being closed, but given the number of properties that are still owned by offshore companies, we have to be ever vigilant. And tax evasion is only one part of the problem. If we look at where the ownership of property in England and Wales is really concentrated, it's no surprise that the highest ranking company where, country where these companies are registered is the British Virgin Islands. And it's one of the most secretive places on earth. Um, you can purchase records from their online register only to find the names of so-called nominees. The problem that 
plagues investigative journalists around the world um, when they're trying to get to the bottom of who owns a company. Um, and these people are usually, these nominees are usually employed by company service providers to act on behalf of the real owners. And those who own land or property this way, I mean, cannot in say via an anonymous company in the British Virgin Islands, it's very difficult to hold them to account, given these could be landlords or freeholders um, making large profits and ultimately with control over someone's home. This is a particularly grim situation. And most importantly, and on top of this, this enables the proceeds of crime and corruption to flow into the UK market largely unchecked. And Global Witness has done a series of investigations um, uh, around this, um, uh, looking at where the proceeds of corruption have been used to buy property um, and has been implicated in money laundering. So we've done this work alongside other partners in, in, from groups who will be making contributions um, this weekend, Transparency International, Finance Uncovered, and of course, um, Rima's, uh, uh, Karina's organization, OCCRP. And we've exposed how offshore secrecy has afforded, um, has allowed the corrupt to use uh, London property more, uh, the London property market. So for instance, in 2015, we uncovered that big chunks of Baker Street, home to London's famous Sherlock Holmes, uh, were owned by a mysterious figure with close ties to a former Kazakh secret police chief accused of murder um, and money laundering. In, 20, in 2018, the National Crime Agency um, unmasked, just as another example, Zamira Ajeva, the wife of an Azeri banker jailed for defrauding his country's state-owned bank out of hundreds of millions. And this was done again by companies based in uh, the British Crown uh, Dependencies, uh, one of the British Pound Dependencies called Guernsey, and also the British Virgin Islands again was, impl um, was implicated. Um, and Hajiva had purchased an 11.5 million pound five bedroom property in Knightsbridge, one of the areas where we see really, really high density and concentration of anonymously owned property. So I'm going to quickly move on to what are the prospects for change in terms of thinking about how we can tackle this issue of anonymously owned property that enables so many of these ills that drive the housing crisis in UK and London. We've really focused primarily on transparency. So corporate secrecy is the, cre is the key ingredient here. And we need reliable public data on the real owners of property and the beneficial owners of companies that hold property. And the critical thing is that this data may be made public is not, not good enough for it to be available to law enforcement um, or to, um, uh, as those who oppose greater levels of corporate transparency often propose. Um, the issue of money laundering in the property market was put on the map by anti-corruption campaigners like OCCRP, uh, like Transparency International and investigative journalists. It exposed an area of fundamental systemic weakness that in some sense the current mechanisms of law enforcement and so forth are not really capable of putting on the map effectively. And there is some, we've had some success. Um, the good news is that um, for this incoming government, uh, the, the government that we have now has promised to introduce this register of public, um, public register of who controls companies. Um, and although of course with COVID-19, we're going to have to see how that impacts the legislative agenda, we have been able to push um, this forward substantially. Um, but given the complexity of the kind of dynamics around what is the cause of uh, London and the UK's fundamental sort of housing crisis, this is only going to be one part of the picture. So Thank I'm you, out of Sam. time now, so I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. You actually just started mentioning, uh, you presented how speculative finance, uh, finance drives the global and local housing crisis in the UK. And uh, I would like to ask you, how is the global money laundering uh, influencing real estate in the UK to the point of evicting real people from their homes and a more uh, mm. insider point of view, especially also during COVID-19, if you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, thanks. I think I think it's sort of it's difficult to tell just given how murky the information is on, on this. But we know, for instance, from Donald Toon, who's the head of the National Crime Agency, um, he's remarked that prices are being artificially driven up by um, criminals who want to sequester their funds in the UK. It's quite interesting that 
when there were more stringent anti-money laundering tricks introduced for real, for real estate agents in the UK, um, there's a good article in the Financial Times that talks about um, someone from the industry reporting that the value for high-end property started to fall. So you have to sort of wonder um, where was this sort of demand in the first place coming from that was sort of driving, keeping the prices high. Um, and, you know, that, of course, rises in prices is, is of, of rent in particular is one of the things that sort of drives homelessness or the primary driver. And we have seen that this has been exacerbated and made worse, um, you know, uh, in the COVID-19 crisis, given that jobs in the service industry have and elsewhere have driven up, uh, have dried up so quickly. Um, and we know that, you know, a vast amount of non-UK capital is used to speculate on property. Um, so, and then some portion of this obviously will be kind of uh, the illicit finance that we were talking about before that's channeled through secrecy jurisdictions. Um, and anecdotally, we know, of course, you know, we're building up a sort of ever greater number of case studies amongst us of just quite how much property, particularly in the kind of high end posh areas of London are owned by kleptocrats and uh, criminals of all, of all description. Um, but it's very, very difficult to get very robust sort of statistics on on exactly sort of what is the cause and effect here, given the fact that um, information is sort of so, so scarce on who the real owners of these uh, properties are. We know that there's a sort of huge appetite um, from the public to sort of find this out. And one of the things that we've Global Witness has done is sort of launched tools that you in the past that you can look up how many anonymously pro owned properties there are in your area. Um, which have been kind of very popular and we've seen um, really good responses to that. So we, so it's again a question that to really address, we need, we need better quality information. Thank you, Sam. And for someone who is not really familiar with the UK law and UK legal framework, how would you summarize uh, how offshore companies and their real owners exploit the loopholes in the UK law to increase profit and avoid scrutiny? So I think, yeah, here, here most of the loopholes that are relevant kind of all, all relate to sort of anonymity and the anonymity that can be afforded by wrapping your ownership of an asset in an offshore company where it's very difficult to find out who's behind it. Um, so this, uh, but there are other kind of loopholes that are relevant for sort of profiteering. Um, although some of them have fortunately um, started to become closed. So they're the ones I was referring to about um, foreign owned property formerly uh, was not taxed um, at the same rate as that just property owned by uh, individual or domestic companies. So you could avoid capital gains tax, for instance, which given the price of the price at which property prices rise in um, the UK is huge. I think one of the key things is that you can just generally avoid scrutiny. So one of Global Witness's investigations from last year showed that one of the biggest offshore owners of land um, were basically trapping, um, and I think they owned, I can't remember the figure, it was sort of 35,000 properties, I believe, um, up and down the country. Uh, they was trapping people in really unfair rental contracts that were doubling. Um, and they, they, it was very, very difficult for people who wanted recourse to the law to ascertain who they needed to follow up with. These companies were kind of just shell companies, really, like with very limited presence in the UK. So it was almost impossible to kind of hold them to account when people feel like um, they'd been done wrong. Um, and then the third thing, of course, is just the anonymity that can allow sort of dirty money. Um, you know, if you're really bent on, if you've, if you've, if you, for instance, um, acquired most of your uh, money through um, uh, stealing things from the state coffers of another country, um, you can then, um, you, you know, the best way of doing that is to sort of use the anonymity afforded by the offshore system, um, and you can, you know, you can try and use that to evade the anti-money laundering checks that are in place with the state agents, because it's just so hard to ascertain who really is the true owner of a given company. 
Thank you, Sam. And you already touched on this uh, regarding uh, the public registers in the U UK. And we know that Global Witness advocates for more transparency worldwide when it comes to uh, company ownership through open company uh, registers. But on a practical level, uh, and as you mentioned, the implementation of such registers proved to have many flaws, especially when it comes to the data quality. How would you summarize the main flaws of the UK's uh, company register? Yeah, so it's a question we get asked a lot because I think everyone's been sort of slamming the, well, firstly, the UK is, 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 a, great, is a great place to launder money um, because of, uh, I think it's like lightly regulated, but, you know, you have this sort of, sort of supposedly kind of emanates this notion of being like reputable and so forth. But actually, we have some really, really kind of opaque um, types of partnerships and companies that we constantly see cropping up in investigations. Scottish Limited Partnerships um, being a really good example of that sort of real money laundering vehicles. Um, but, you know, I would like to just caveat with what I'm going to say about the problems with the UK register with the fact that, that at least the UK has actually an open register. And all the problems that we've identified with it, which have been written extensively about in the media and by, by ourselves, are only visible because we can see them, right? And we know for a fact that kind of closed registers are a disaster when it comes to accountability. Um, without the pressure and, and scrutiny from civil society, bad data will just be left in place and no one will know about it. Um, and fundamentally, you know, it reduces the incentives for companies to file good quality data if they know they won't be called out in public for it. It's much, it's much less expensive to lie in private than it is in public. That being said, we have found a number of issues. Um, so the first one really, and the kind of primary one, is that the body, and this is, I think this is quite common in lots of countries, the body that's responsible for collecting data on companies does not really have the mandate or the resources to do the requisite verification um, and to investigate those companies and individuals who are likely um, using companies for foul play. Um, there is a sort of consultation process going on now that the global witness isn't fed into, but I think the key thing here really is that um, the company register is simply just receiving data, self-reported data, and going, okay, that's fine. And we found instances in our reporting and our analysis of the data where, you know, statements are just obviously false. You know, people, you know, one-year-old children owning sort of a hundred companies or you know people who haven't been born yet um owning owning companies and you know in the first instance at least there was not this basic level of validation things are uh things are improving somewhat another issue that we found um and i'm sure uh you know karina can attest to this as well um is sort of lack of lack of identifying information about individuals um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to sort of know that this John Smith is the John Smith that's the subject of your uh, investigation and it makes analysis quite difficult. And of course, there's a there's a, there's there's a balance around kind of privacy uh, to be to be made. But I think we feel quite strongly. Well, I feel quite strongly that if you own a company and are afforded the sort of right of or um the privilege of limited liability and the legal personhood of that company it does come at a cost to your privacy that you you know you need to be identifiable um because um because of because of the possibility of misusing that company um and the advantages it confers on you so that is one of the sort of pressure points and difficulties in sort of really using the information is lack of identifying information we have a bit of it in the uk so we have month and year of birth that you can see but in looking, you know, it's, we haven't just worked in the UK on beneficial ownership, currently doing quite a lot of work at the moment in Myanmar on beneficial ownership and lack of identifying information is, is, a, is a really critical, um, critical point that needs to, needs to be embedded in any, any public register of this kind if it's to be successful. Thank you so much, Sam. And we now move to our next speaker, uh, Karina Shudrovsky, uh, who is the head of OCCRP uh, research team and has worked uh, with a network of journalists to trace people, companies and assets across the globe. 
since joining Investigative Dashboard in 2017, Karina has contributed to uh, reach a number of OCCRP uh, projects, uh, including the Paradise Papers and the Daphne Project, where she helped uncover the secret property holdings of Azerbaijan ruling family. She led the Dubai's Golden Sands Project, a cross-border investigation into a leaked property database that revealed uh, how many uh, how wealthy people from the uh, uh, around the world take advantage of the United Arab Emirates uh, secrecy. And today, Karina would like uh, to tell us more about the uh, Golden Sands Project and uh, what you uh, the whole findings of your investigations. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you for that intro. Um, yeah, so I'm the head of the research team at OCCRP. Uh, just to give a quick little background on um, uh, what OCCRP is, we're an investigative journalism platform for a network of media outlets and journalists around the world. Um, so in addition to cross-border collaborations with our partners, we also provide our member centers with a range of resources and tools, um, including digital and physical, physical security, um, a global archive of research material for investigative reporting, which is called ALIF, and research support, uh, which is what my team does. Um, and as Rima said, we provide support for journalists within our network to track down people, company, companies, and assets for their um, investigations. So um, in addition to my role of leading this team of researchers from six different countries around the world, I led this Dubai's Golden Sands project. Um, <clears throat> which was a cross-border investigation that took a look at this leaked property database from Dubai and used it to really tell the story of uh, the Emirate as the safe haven for money laundering and corruption. Um, this story is a really good example of you know, how we use our network of journalists around the world to tell a story that can resonate globally. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to use these 10 minutes to kind of explain to you what we did um, and what we found. Um, first, I think I should start with, you know, kind of how we embarked on this in the first place. We do a lot of reporting on organized crime and corruption. And, you know, what we found was that a lot of major corruption scandals link to Dubai. So we really set out to kind of understand what it is about Dubai that makes it so appealing to all of these players and what makes it so easy to exploit. Um, and what we found is that it's a combination of quite a few things, and I'm just going to quickly run through them. Um, one, it's that the gold markets there, um, they're basically, it's basically the easiest place in the world to move gold with essentially no questions asked about the origin. Um, it's a major trade and remittance hub, and there, so there are systems in place there that allow traders to move money with very little regulation. Uh, number three is that there are more than 20 free zones in Dubai that basically exist with these incentives to attract international investment. Um, you know, some of these incentives are 100% foreign ownership, there's tax exemption, and there's really loose regulations. Um, four, it's the ease of obtaining visas, um, specifically this property investment visa, where basically if you make an investment in Dubai property for about 300,000 US dollars, it'll, per, you'll, it'll buy you this residency visa. Um, and with this visa comes access to banking services and corporate vehicles in Dubai, all which provide secrecy that a lot of people are after. And then there's, of course, the real estate market. Um, and, you know, people aren't only flocking to Dubai to live there, but they're also purchasing property as a good investment. Um, the real estate sector in general is a major contributor to the economic growth in Dubai and the UAE as, you know, the country of the UAE. Um, as of 2016, the construction and real estate sectors contributed to 20% of the country's GDP. Um, and when we wrote the story, more than half of the investors in property were foreigners. So basically, um, the authorities there are trying to create these incentives to attract foreigners and make um, more people invest. And what these incentives actually make it vulnerable to money laundering. Uh, and, you know, with our reporting, what we found is that purchasing property is a really simple process. Uh, there are really no questions asked about the origins of your money. There are very few rules and regulations um, in place. They basically just care if you can pay for the property. 
And we actually found that agents prefer that you pay for your property with cash. Um, both of these are right off the bat, make it really vulnerable. Um, we actually even found an example, a real estate agent told us that his organization blatantly um, participated in money laundering. And the way that this worked was someone walked in to purchase property with a bag of cash and you know purchased this property. And then a few days later, uh, canceled the transaction. And that money was refunded to him through a bank, which essentially cleans the money. Um, and some of the pro, you know, some of that money was paid in commission to the real estate agent um, and the company overall. So kind of everyone won. Um, there's also um, in Dubai kind of been more of a crackdown on money laundering into other financial markets, but there's still been very few curbs on money laundering in real estate. Uh, this issue was highlighted in the Financial Action Task Force's um, report that recently came out at the end of April. Um, and you know, the report overall just claimed that there's a lot of work to do in the UAE when it comes to combating money laundering and terrorist financing, but they actually you know, highlighted the real estate sector. And what they, kind of, what they said was that while um, there are more suspicious transaction reports coming out of other sectors like the money transfer services and the banking sector, there are still very few coming out of the real estate sector and the precious minerals and stones trade. And these are two like really important and high risk sectors that they would expect more reports coming out of. And basically this lack of reports really limits the um, information that's available for authorities who are actually investigating money laundering and terrorist financing. And then there's just the last thing that you know makes this sector so appealing is the penchant for secrecy in Dubai. Um, there's no public land registry to check who owns property there. And that's why this leak of information that we got was so important and so interesting. Uh, and what this leak was, was a um, collection of property and residency data that was compiled by real estate professionals between 2014 and 2016. Um, like I said, there is no official registry where this information is being held. So this was kind of, is kind of the next best thing. These are the names, uh, there were 54,000 addresses, the names of 129,000 owners and renters, um, previous and present, current at the time that we got the leak, and they're from 181 different countries. And you know, this data was kind of organized in a messy way, but what it included was the property code, so the specific property in question, the name of the owner or the renter, um, some sort of contact information, and in most cases, um, their nationality, what country they came from. And what we did with this information was we used it to organize the data in a different way. So we took these nationalities and these countries and split up the data into country-specific spreadsheets and distributed it to our partners around the world. And the reason we did this was we figured that you know people recognize interesting players most from their own countries and we also had this other list of people who didn't have their nationality listed so what we did was we took that list and cross-referenced it against some interesting data sets that we have in aleph that platform that investigative data platform that i mentioned earlier and you know some of these data sets include sanctions lists peps lists um, interpol's most wanted list etc and what we ended up with was a list of 500 names of potentially interesting people. And you know, kind of how Sam was talking about um, confirming the identity of people. This was extremely difficult in this case as well, as you can imagine. Um, so what we did was we had to then use the little bit of information in this data to confirm the identities. We made phone calls, we sent emails, and we ended up with a, name, a list of a, um, a little over 100 people, organized criminals, sanctioned individuals, and um, politicians that basically prove the open secret that this lack of transparency, light regulations, and seeming disinterest in the origins of money that end up in Dubai um, make it a really attractive place for people who want to hide their money. Um, you know, some of the names included, like I said, criminals like Othman Al-Baluti, who allegedly runs a cocaine import business from Belgian, um, from the Belgian port of Antwerp, um, and politicians like the Azeri royal, royal family, uh, ruling family, sorry, 
um, and a lot of sanctioned individuals who would typically have a lot of trouble purchasing property in other markets. Um, and you know, all of this was published as an interactive map where you could see kind of who owns property, where their property is, and a short description of kind of who they are and why we thought that they were interesting. Um, in addition to that map, we also published some stories that kind of went into more detail about the specific um, properties and the specific players that we found to be you know, most interesting. Um, one of these stories came from our partners at HETC in Armenia, where they exposed a number of Armenian government officials who owned property in Dubai, and the value of that property seemed to be kind of at odds with their positions and their known salaries. And after they published that story, prosecutors actually launched a criminal case against one of the officials um, that was the subject of their story. Um, and the case was for reporting false information and hiding data subject to declaration. Um, and just the last thing that I kind of wanted to finish on was another piece of impact that came out of our partnership with Transparency International, uh, the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. Um, this partnership exists with the purpose of combining investigative journalism with civil society engagement to kind of get the most impact out of our work. Um, and after we published the Dubai's Golden Sand Project, uh, TI came out with a number of recommendations for the UAE government to clean up its real estate sector. Um, and just the, the one that I wanted to highlight and you know end on, which goes off of you know everything that Sam was talking about, which is, is just the importance of open land and beneficial ownership registries. Um, had we known the names, had these names been public, I don't think people would have been so quick to flock to Dubai to purchase this land in the first place. Um, and we kind of got lucky that because this registry wasn't public, people weren't using shell companies um, from secrecy jurisdictions to purchase this land. They actually put their real names there. Um, so in this case, because this information was leaked to us, we were able to actually see the true owners. But with a beneficial ownership registry and open land registry, um, kind of the risk of money laundering through real estate in Dubai would be significantly uh, decreased. Thank you so much, Karina. And I highly recommend to check out uh, the Dubai's Golden Sands uh, website. And as you mentioned, uh, Karina, it's organized uh, through an interactive map where you can see the properties. There is uh, the list of profiles and uh, the stories. And I personally find it one of the most um, usable uh, ways to uh, read the findings of your investigation. Um, the project, uh, Dubai's Golden Sands, is another time where we see how data leaking and whistleblowing are vital or sometimes the only way to expose corruption worldwide. How does OCCRP facilitate whistleblowers and sources in sharing information in a secure and anonymous way? Yeah, so believe it or not, um, this is just more about trust than it is about the technology that we use. Um, <clears throat> most of the leaks that we get for the investigations that we do actually come from people approaching reporters on the ground that they've built trust with and actually handing them a hard drive of data. Um, we do have the technical tools in place. Um, we have SecureDrop, something called SecureDrop. Um, we all use encryption. We all use Signal to communicate with each other. We encrypt our emails. But you, know, you have to be a fairly technical source to be able to use SecureDrop. Um, it's not that user friendly. And we also found that it's not so great when it comes to large amounts of data, um, which is what we typically get. So, you know, we do re we rely mostly on kind of boots on the ground, people sharing data person to person. Um, and, you know, if you're worried about some an organization like the NSA, Secure Drop is should be your go to um, because it's completely anonymous. Uh, when you put data there, it's completely anonymous. But in our case, most of the sources are more worried about you know, local organized crime gangs or local governments. Um, so, you know, we encourage them to get burner phones, to use signal for communication and kind of communicate with us that way. And the other way that we'll get data in, which was um, the case for this Dubai's Golden Sands project is through trusted partners, um, whether it's TI or in this case, it was C4 ADS in DC. Um, and they were the ones who actually obtained this leaked database and knew that we had this network of journalists around the world that would actually be able to use it um, properly. So they trusted us and passed on the data to us that way. 
Thank you, uh, Karina. And your investigation exposed a number, numerous cases of money laundering in Dubai, including, the, uh, as you mentioned, the president of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Ilham Aliyev, and his family. Um, first, uh, did the government of Dubai say, say anything about this after uh, having published the findings of your investigation? And also, you mentioned the recommendation by Transparency International. And have any individuals or companies uh, been charged with money laundering? No, <laughs> uh, no. Um, so, you know, first, um, in this specific instance, with the government, with the ruling family of Azerbaijan, there was no um, specific reaction here. And I think that's mostly because it's really no secret. Um, the government, the ruling family of Azerbaijan owns property and yachts all over the world. Um, so this um, exposing and kind of confirming what everyone already knew didn't have so much of a reaction in Azerbaijan. Um, and then, of course, in terms of the government of Dubai, um, when we were publishing this story, we gave them the right to reply um, before we published. And what I received from the director general of the Dubai Land Department was basically just a Word document outlining their anti-money laundering approach. Um, it used a lot of jargon and a lot of like um, names of different laws that they've kind of been implementing and applying. Um, but you know what we've seen time and time again from our reporting um, is just that these laws may be on the books, but they aren't actually being implemented properly at all. Um, and that Financial Action Task Force report that I had mentioned um, earlier is kind of really reflective of that, right? Um, and I think that like something ironic to mention at the end, um, from the end of this Word document that I received from the Director General of the Dubai Land Department was he ended it with the department has absolutely absolute control over real estate professionals, including real estate agents and developers. Um, and I thought this was kind of an interesting topic throughout the time that we were doing this investigation because Dubai is this absolute monarchy that runs the um, emirate like a business, right? The ruling family runs it like a business. Um, and they have control over every single aspect of the economy. So, you know, while they can't really claim that they don't know that this money laundering is going on, right? They have all of this um, supervision and they can't really claim that they don't know that this money laundering is happening. Um, and, you know, what we found after speaking to experts is that it's really in their interest to keep Dubai this way um, because Dubai really wouldn't be as developed as it is right now if it didn't allow this illicit money to end up there. Thank you, Karina. And back to the um, case of the Azari uh, ruling family, um, I wanted to mention that uh, a case uh, from Tunisia, uh, Wiki when WikiLeaks uh, occurred and information about uh, the crimes of the Ben Ali regime, which is the dictatorship uh, that took place uh, in Tunisia uh, for 24 years before the Tunisian revolution in 2011, uh, having that information uh, diffused and exposed through local media in Tunisia actually uh, helped and contributed uh, to raise, uh, to know more about what's happening in the country. And maybe if like Tunisia knew about the corruption of the uh, regime, they didn't really have proof. So having hard proof uh, had such an impact on the Tunisian population. Uh, how is it like for, in the case of Aliyev, are you aware of how the story reached the Azeri investigative media and citizens? Uh, especially considering how uh, Azerbaijan's a shocker record on free expression. Yeah, this is an issue that we face all the time. We're pretty regularly publishing content in countries that censor us specifically for the content that we publish. Um, this is a, the case in Azerbaijan. Our site is completely blocked. Um, and also in countries like Venezuela, where we're kind of intermittently censored. Um, and we have a few ways around this. Um, to make sure that the stories get to the people that need to hear it the most. Um, one way is that we make sure that all the content is on the Wayback Machine, which is this website that kind of archives um, websites so people can access it that way. And also for the case of Azerbaijan specifically, um, our member center there is Maidan TV. And they have this really technical way to mirror their site 
So what they do is they pretty much just whip up a bit.ly link that they then share on Facebook. And that allows people in the country to access the content that way. Um, another thing is, you know, we just recently in, um, published another investigation from Azerbaijan that included a pretty lengthy documentary that really, you know, went through the details of the investigation and put, we put it on YouTube and, you know, YouTube isn't blocked in Azerbaijan. Um, so that's a few ways to really re reach the public. There are a few other technical things that, you know, activists and more technical journalists can use, such as Tor and Onion Service, and we make all of these things available, um, and also uh, using VPNs. But you know, the biggest thing is that when we do come out with the story, especially one that's going to be of interest to people in these countries where our site is blocked, we do a big push on social media around all of the options that people have to read the stories. Um, so all of these things that we, I just explained, we kind of do a campaign around making sure that the people who need to hear it the most can. Thank you, Karina. Uh, I wanted to, in the next uh, 10 minutes give you the floor if you would like to interact with uh, each other's uh, statements uh, um, or else uh, if you would like uh, to talk about how um, the tools and the resources that you would recommend uh, uh, for projects that you would like to use publicly available uh, or leaked data to expose corruption. So that's, yeah, I mean, I'd love to uh, ask ask a couple of questions. So, um, Karina, I mean, can, clearly this sort of gold um, Dubai Golden Sands investigation was a massive success in terms of being a kind of cross-border um, investigative collaboration. And it was built around, as you said, um, a leaked data set that you then kind of needed to like divvy up um, and make the most of sort of local expertise. Can you pass off any other kind of tips for these type of collaborations? Because they must involve a sort of huge amount of kind of bureaucratic complexity and kind of different concerns around uh, security for people involved. Um, and then sort of managing to synthesize this into kind of like one single narrative must have been, been very difficult. Totally. And, you know, this was my first time managing such a large cross border. Um, project like this. So I really learned a lot as I was going through. And there's a lot of things I probably would have done differently had I done it again um, a few years later. Um, you know, one thing that's key is, you know, getting all the information to all the, um, you know, participants right from the beginning. I think that ICIJ mm -hmm. does a really good job at this, where they'll have like mm -hmm. a kickoff meeting and really get down into the nitty gritty with every single detail, with every single person participating so that everyone's on the same page right off the bat. I found that a lot of times with this project, I would you know, think that something was maybe straightforward because it was in my mind and you know, maybe it wasn't. So then someone, I kept having to go back and forth between people um, and that ended up proving, you know, it ended up wasting a lot of everyone's time. Um, but you know, we do a lot of cross-border investigations like this at OCCRP, um, as you know, so we do have the tools in place um, that do make this easier. Um, one major thing is our wiki, where basically everyone who's participating puts information in this Wikipedia style um, website that um, everyone has access to. So the idea is like to make sure that you maintain this information sharing from the beginning to end. Yeah. And we have some cool tools like that that make that easier. Yeah, just um, just to follow up on that, because I, I think it's I think it's really fascinating that you know in the wake of the work that you guys have done, but also the ICIJ has done, that this sort of collaborative model of journalism is becoming a lot more common. But in some ways, it seems to me to sort of, and you still you know you still feel this occasion on collaborations that it runs up against some of the the culture of being a journalist in some respects that you kind of want to monopolize the scoop and now you're asking people to kind of put things up on a wiki like that they're, they're just leads that you know um how you know how, how have you faced some of that in terms of this notion of sort of fostering trust amongst a sort of fairly disparate group of journalists who might be that way inclined totally and you know i started at oc i started my journalism career at occrp so i've been you know, used to this style of information sharing from the beginning. And then when people come in to start collaborating with us from different types of organizations that, um, you know, maybe more some more traditional 
news organizations, they're kind of like, whoa, this is, you know, this doesn't feel natural. Um, so I think that, you know, the biggest, and I'm always kind of surprised at other people's um, hesitancy to then go and, you know, share this information because we really do have this culture at OCCRP of, um, you know, collaboration and sharing. And I think that what makes this the easiest is our kind of network of member centers. Um, you know, we have about 50 member centers around the world that we really are, you know, there to kind of support each other all the time. So, you know, like I said, we have this research desk where journalists from these member centers can come to us and we're providing like hands on support for their investigations. And um, so then if I'm faced with an issue where I need company documents out of Nigeria, and I have to, someone has to go in person, I'm able to now go to our colleague in Nigeria who will help me out. So I think that it's this, what we get used to is like constantly collaborating and it's kind of this um, favor sharing in a way where we help you sometimes, you help us. And I think that it creates this culture of, you know, trust and also, you know, people wanting to give to each other because they may be received. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 it's, I, I see that because it feels to me the sort of whole notion of investigating um, money laundering in the property market, whichever city you take in the world, whether or not it's New York, is always going to require that sort of, it's a, it's a sort of typical kind of cross-border problem. And so thinking about sort of ways of groups and maybe perhaps in the audience doing this as well. But um, I mean, I was kind of fascinated by the example that you gave of someone coming in with bags of cash to buy a property and then subsequently just basically asking for a refund um did your did the investigation that you do um sort of dig into the sort of financial institutions that were basically taking these funds and also asking no questions in this sort of fairly wild west environment um we did not um we kind of just wanted to use this um you know leak of property to kind of just show and tell the story right um i think there's a lot more work and you know one thing i kind of didn't emphasize that i think i really should have is that just because someone owns property there doesn't act we're not actually accusing them right off the bat of any wrongdoing um you know they could own it with completely legitimate money um so the idea was to kind of the story was really twofold it's like one who are the types of people that go to dubai and what we found was that it was a number of sanctioned individuals and um politicians who maybe shouldn't have been able to afford it or sanctioned individuals who maybe weren't wouldn't be able to purchase land anywhere else and then the second fold was kind of what is it about dubai that makes it so appealing because maybe they were laundering money but you know we couldn't we can't really accuse someone of wrongdoing just by having their name just by proving that they owned property there um mm. so yeah we really mostly focused on kind of the um the people and then the overall story of Dubai without actually um, digging so much into the uh, institutions there. But I think that there's definitely a lot of work to be done um, in that front. But, you know, part, like you were talking about getting um, information out of the UK and how it's open, like we sometimes are faced with issues of trying to get company reg information out of Dubai and it's nearly impossible. Um, there, it is not public at all um and you have to maybe you can there's some companies there that basically have some monopoly on access to these registries um, of companies in the uae and you have to pay them like 700 pounds to get them to go to the registry and you know get this information for you so you know while there is a lot a lot of work to be done it's really really difficult because of how opaque it is Thank you uh, both. Uh, your investigation, uh, Karina, with OCCRP showed how Dubai is at the heart of global organized crime with a recipe that includes one of the most secretive legislations and banking systems, lack of transparency, uh, free port and gold markets uh, with deliberate laissez-faire policies, all under the oppressive rule of Al Maktoum royal family. Aside from media exposures, uh, how 
how are initiatives like the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium working uh, towards global accountability? And I would like also to ask the same question to um, to Sam for how is the role of uh, a global witness and how uh, global women interacts with other stakeholders uh, together uh, towards uh, uh, guaranteeing global accountability? Should I go first? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, um, basically, you know, the purpose of it is to connect Transparency International chapters with investigative reporters. Um, but as journalists, you know, we kind of, our goal and our role is to just put the information out there. Um, our aim as, you know, at OCCRP is to really just unearth the information and make it publicly available. Um, we're not lobbyists, but what we but we rely on organizations like TI and their chapters and other follow the money NGOs to then take our information and use it to, you know, they package our findings, demand change, and even then engage law enforcement in whatever the subject is. Um, and you know, in practice, how this works is that when we have an investigation that's coming up about corruption in a country that we think is relevant for a TI chapter, um, we'll discuss it with them pre-publication and give them some time to get prepared, to plan and strategize um, so that they can kind of use the momentum from our story for their advocacy. Um, but all this time, we kind of make sure that we stay in our lane uh, and we're careful to stick to the journalistic ethics that we you know, believe in. And we only give them access to the key bits of information. We're not gonna share the source data or any leaked data. Um, it's really just that those key bits of information that they'll need in order to plan this advocacy in advance. Um, and this relationship really works the other way too. If a TI chapter has information that they think that we would find useful for an investigation, they'll also be able to They'll also share that data with us and we'll use it that way. Um, one really just quickly a cool example of what came out of our collab, what came out of GAC, what we call it the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, is from the Azerbaijani laundromat, which was in 2017, we exposed a $2.9 billion money laundering operation in slush fund, which was run by Azerbaijan's ruling elite. And what we found was that they use this money to influence European politicians, representatives of international organizations, and even journalists. Um, and in one specific case, delegates of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe were among the recipients of the money. And they kind of, we found that it, they took this money and then started speaking pos positively about Azerbaijan, et cetera. Um, and after we published the story, TI did a number of things. One, they rallied the public for, you know, they rallied public pressure for an independent, independent investigation into these allegations of corruption at pace. Um, so they asked people to sign and send letters to their political representatives at the Council of Europe calling for this investigation. Um, and there was actually a recent success that came out of TI's um, advocacy. Um, authorities in Germany actually recently launched investigations into PACE members that were allegedly receiving these bribes a year after TI's chapter in Germany um, formally submitted a criminal complaint based on our Azerbaijani laundromat story. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how that relationship works. So yeah, from, from sort of my side in terms of how Global Witness Works, I suppose we we sit somewhere further along the sort of spectrum than OCCRP in that we we do, we are explicitly a kind of like um, uh, advocacy organization and we do do we do do a lot of advocacy, but we also do do our own original research and 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 uh, much like uh, Karina is saying, we sort of, you know, have um, very rigorous kind of internal standards around um, uh, editorial control and fact checking and so forth to make sure that our our research is of the highest quality. Um, I could just say a few words about, I suppose, you know, our advocacy. And I think, I think actually some of our advocacy around beneficial ownership has been a good example of um, kind of a global effort to sort of work in tandem in order to develop a standard and influence the agenda in different different countries, um, not just limited to the UK. So we work as part of the Open Ownership um, Partnership, which is a group dedicated to sort of building a beneficial ownership data standard. 
um, a corresponding sort of open data register and um, brings together a number of groups working in this area. Um, for over, I think, 10 years now, we've, we've worked as a sort of core member of the Publish What You Pay Coalition, um, where this focus is very much on transparency, but this time around transparency, around um, uh, payments, extractives companies, uh, are making to governments sort of a common site of bribery um, and a particularly important issue given glo global witnesses um, record of uh, doing research into corruption in the oil, gas and mining industries. And this is made up of um, a huge number of civil society organizations um, uh, around the world uh, working on the sort of like common agenda that we sort of um, attempt to drive uh, drive forward. Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, I would like now to pass the floor to uh, Lika from Disruption Network Lab, uh, who would be uh, bringing you the questions uh, from the audience. All right. Thank you, Rima. So, yeah, we had a number of questions from the chat. So the way we do it is I will read out uh, three of the questions uh, all together, and then um, you can pick them and answer them, uh, each of you. So first of all, there's a question for Sam. Um, who are the company registers that are responsible for investigating companies? And are they federally owned? And if so, are there governmental policies being put in place to remedy this that you know of? I guess remedy this mm -hmm. meaning the anonymity and the lack of transparency. Um, mm -hmm. Then also another question for Sam. So in the beginning, you mentioned a lot of uh, numbers. You cited things from reports. And could you say something about where people can find more information on these? And then a question for Karina. Uh, if the corruption in Dubai is connected with the globalization of organized crime and corruption, do you know other countries that work under a similar model? So handing over great. to you. Yeah, great. So um, on the first question, uh, so who are the company registers responsible for investigating? Um, so not they're not really responsible for investigating anyone. And at present, they don't have the kind of mandate to do sort of the, I suppose the type of you know, my investigations we're talking about here into sort of money laundering and so forth. Um, I believe that would be sort of the National Crime Agency. Um, uh, uh, whether or not, so it's called Companies House in the UK. This is the sort of register and the register of land ownership is, is the land registry. Um, they, well, that's sort of a peculiar situation, I believe. Um, I believe, yeah, Companies House is um, is government owned. The land registry until fairly recently was what was called a trading fund. So there was sort of an expectation that it had to return um, or at least cover its costs um, by government and that actually provided incentives for it to sort of charge um, rather large amounts of money for the data that they were providing, which was kind of, in our, in our opinion, against the public interest. That does look like that status of being a trading fund has now been removed. So we're optimistic that maybe some more of the data that they publish, which is critical for doing you know, the type of research we're talking about here, um, will be available. Um, and in terms of uh, governmental policy shifting, I think the most substantial one has has been the introduction of the sort of UK's beneficial ownership register. Um, and as we were talking about before, so that that compels companies that are legally mandated, they will, sorry, they're legally required now um, to maintain a register of beneficial owners and update the centralized record um, within a matter of weeks um, of any changes. And that data is available via a web accessible web interface um, and also available as bulk data um for journalists uh, who who want to sort of um or academics who want to make uh, more use of it um in terms of reform at the land registry as i said it's no longer a trading fund we're hopeful that this will mean that there will be more freely freely available data they do publish data on uh price paid and they actually now have a very useful data set for people who are interested in looking more into the uk situation um that's freely available of all uh properties owned by overseas companies um, and we're hopeful that of course you know in in, in due course and over the next um, uh, the next parliament oh not the next parliament but this this current government that we that the property register will be introduced which will actually be a beneficial ownership of the register of foreign companies that own property in England and Wales um, in terms of the second question so I'm just gonna I remind myself of what that was about was. the numbers um, like where they could find yeah, them about uh, the numbers. 
Sure. So I will, um, we, we, they're all sort of wrapped up in various different kind of bits of reports and research that we've done. Um, I'll put out, uh, I can sort of tweet after this, um, uh, session, uh, the sort of links, um, but yeah, the global witness org site is, uh, where to go. Um, I'm sure if you, yeah, if you search that for anonymous property, um, you'll be able to get the kind of, uh, the reports and the investigations that I was referring to, um, around Baker street, um, and, uh, Kazak, former chief of police. Thank you, Sam. Up to you, Karina. Um, okay, so yeah, so the question was, um, if the corruption in Dubai is connected with the globalization of organized crime and corruption, are there any other countries that work under a similar model? Um, you know, what I mean by Dubai being connected to this globalization of organized crime and corruption is that these players, these people who are hiding their illicit money or these organized criminals who are engaging in illegal um, acts are, are able to go to Dubai to hide that money, continue to do business. And it's basically the ease of doing this business and the ease of doing it secretly that attracts them to Dubai. And since this is people coming from all over the world, that's what I really mean by the globalization, right? It's bringing people from all over the world together and allowing them to function in this environment. Um, basically, any place in the world that offers the secrecy is going to be contributing to that as well. Um, the UK, as Sam's been talking about a lot, is one of those places. If I can purchase property in the UK anonymously and and I have a, a legal money that I need to park somewhere, no matter where in the world I'm from, that makes um, the UK kind of a player in this um, whole story. Um, and all of these offshore jurisdictions, like um, all these places that keep coming up in our investigations and in our corruption stories, um, like BVI, um, even Cyprus, all these places that kind of allow um, people to hide their ownership, are places that contribute to this um, globalization of organized crime and corruption, that no matter where in the world you're from, you could hide your money elsewhere and you know trade elsewhere and trade secretly. Um, so yeah, I think that Dubai is attractive because it is kind of what I call it like this one-stop shop um, where you know in some places maybe you can only purchase property secretly. In some places maybe you can um, keep your money in a company so you can avoid taxes. But Dubai seems to really have all of it, right? You can trade, you can register companies, you can purchase property secretly. Um, so I think that Dubai is this place that's um, maybe not unique, but um, from what I found through investigations that I've you know helped on and worked on, that it really just has it all, um, which I haven't seen in too many other places. Thank All right. you, Karina. Go ahead. So, yeah, we have two more uh, questions from our chat since we have a bit more time, so we can have a bit more audience questions. Um, so this is a question for both Sam and Karina. Uh, is the popular media disseminating the information from your investigations or are there other infrastructures in place to encourage this? And then a question specifically to Sam, but I guess maybe also Karina would she like to share her opinion on this. Uh, speaking about collaboration and sharing, would you imagine to make cross investigations with other organizations related to the topic of organized crime and corruption and real estate? And which data would the investigation at Global Witness benefit from? Okay, um, I, I can take that. Yeah, do you want do you want to go first, Karina? Nope, you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, okay, I can take that. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we engage in, um, uh, we're not sort of, we're not quite sort of set up in the same way as OCCRP is in terms of being kind of this, this hub for sort of cross border sort of collaboration. Uh, but you know, most of our successful collabor most of our success, most successful investigations certainly are ones where we're working, uh, with partners in multiple countries. Um, and obviously the topic of kind of uh, corruption and particularly money laundering in, in real estate is something that we've worked a lot on in the past. Um, 
so uh you know what data would would, would we would we benefit from in this respect i mean sort of i suppose uh data that's not currently public so leaked data is obviously the sort of holy grail with respect to kind of doing these kinds of investigations so that you can sort of serve up new and novel insights because i think there's lots of um in the in the uk context at least there's been lots of sort of analysis of the publicly available data um by ourselves but also by uh, by others, um, of course, you know. Uh, I think I think Karina's example is a, is a great is a great one where you have where you don't have any central body collecting this information, but there's there's an industry group um, body, um, and that 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 data falls into the hands of some very able uh, and willing journalists. I mean, um, this is uh, you know with, with with locations and information on ownership and uh, you know that sort of information, of course, uh, would be very very interesting. Um, I mean, anything that kind of, you know, pierces the corporate corporate veil, so data on uh, company ownership from company service providers, you know, the sort of stuff that was uh, served up, of course, in, in both the Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers is, is, is immensely valuable to investigative journalists, given the number of sort of leads we have on ongoing investigations where you just hit a dead end, you know, you hit a, um, a sort of... Um, a sort of a foreign Liberian company or something that's register is run out of, I believe it's somewhere like Washington DC by a private company. And they, they charge like Karina saying hundreds of dollars just to access the, the, the data and, and who knows what they do when you make the request. So um, it's, uh, um, yeah, you know, anything like that. And we, we, we're very keen, we're very keen to collaborate in general. And yeah, one more thing I would add about, you know, shame goes for us with basically everything Sam said, you know, but, and another thing is that maybe even, you know, easier is like had Sam had mentioned these ultimate beneficial ownership registries that do exist, but not for the public. Um, a lot of these, you know, Isle of Man, for example, is a place where people register companies all the time, but, and there is a beneficial ownership registry, but it's not something that, um, you know, we can act, we as journalists can access. Um, so that's, you know, just going off of that. And also, um, you know, just land, a lot of the time land information is, um, you know, publicly accessible if you know the address and you know the specific property in question that you're looking after, um, but you can't really access it in bulk or you can't really, you know, search it by an individual's name. Um, which makes it really hard to kind of, you know, do any of these investigations if you don't have a starting point. Um, so I do think that that's another thing that would be kind of quite helpful for us when we are looking into real estate and the people who own it and just have, make it more transparent. All right. Um, so since we have a bit of time, there was one more question also for both of you. Uh, if you could say something about how your institutions are financed and especially how you guarantee the neutrality of the published information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Global Witness is financed um, by a number of kind of philanthropic philanthropic donors and funds when we, we're not sort of set up at the moment um, to sort of take um, lots of grassroots donations, although if people really like our work, we do, you know, do of course encourage that as well. And um, and in terms of sort of uh, making sure that we um, that we sort of remain, you know, remain neutral, which is absolutely essential uh, for the work we're doing and, and critical if we're going to be um, sort of a credible voice speaking truth to power, um, we, we have sort of a, an independent process by which we establish strategic priorities and when it comes to our research um, we have a very very kind of robust and well worked out legal and fact check pro process that keeps kind of um, you know holds the standards of our research you know to you know, holds us to a very high standard and making sure that impartiality and neutrality and fairness are absolutely kind of core uh, to all the research that we provide um, yeah and same goes for us uh, we do get um, a number of our donors are uh, big foundations who give money to organizations like ours who are doing this kind of work. Um, and we do have a few um, government donors, but I think that one big trick here is to one, you know, diversify that and make sure that our money is coming from a lot of different angles. But it is also, it mostly just has to do with our um, internally and the ethics that we really hold ourselves to. 
Um, as Sam said, we have a crazy fact checking process um, that some people would, you know, if you talk to anyone at OCCRP, would complain to you a lot about uh, Birgit and our fact checking team. Um, but what that really does is make sure that, you know, we're telling the truth fully. Um, all of the information that we publish is factual and, you know, official sources. Um, and we also have a legal team. You know, we haven't lost a lawsuit yet. We have been sued and we have not lost a lawsuit yet. And that, you know, is thanks to our legal team and the fact checking that we go through um, because we are very, very careful. Um, you know, we're going up against a lot of very powerful people and um, who could basically, you know, shut down OCCRP pretty easily um, in the, in the um, courts. So, you know, just that alone keeps us really, really accountable and makes sure that we um, are only telling the truth and doing it the, the right way. All Thank right. you, Kar Thank you, Karina. Um, and I wanted to ask you, as we've, we've been uh, talking about like funding, and we've heard you also before uh, in the beginning talking a little bit about uh, your background, and if you'd like to say more about what uh, brought you to such projects, and maybe for uh, both your organizations, uh, uh, we're curious to know how you're soliciting a, a citizen participation and having people uh, basically contribute uh, to your work. Um, how is it possible to use these different resources that uh, you mentioned and how accessible uh, they are to have more people working and, and using this data? Um, I can start. Um, so for, in terms of getting, you know, citizen uh, participation, um, one, you know, I kept mentioning this platform called Aleph which is um, kind of this investigative data platform that allows users to search, um, but also you know, upload their own data sets and use it to kind of um, cross-reference against other data sets, et cetera. Um, so one you know, really basic, straightforward way is that we're constantly um, welcoming people to upload data onto Aleph and um, you know, kind of participate in this information sharing with us. Um, there's also, you know, part of our job also, in addition to kind of telling these investigators, like telling these stories of organized crime and corruption is um, working with our member centers and providing support. So like I said, we have Aleph and also my research team where we're supporting journalists around the world. Um, and we also are kind of collecting information on uh, registries and websites that um, publish this information that we use for our investigations. Um, and we're having this, we have this catalog of these resources on our website. So if someone doesn't really know where to go, if they need to get um, information from companies in Luxembourg, you can come to our site and find it. And we are, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. So we also do have this open call to the public to contribute to that, um, to, you know, go onto our GitLab and actually um, comment if maybe this link is dead because it used to be active and now it's not, or they know about this really cool source in their country that we don't know about. Um, so we are also constantly calling out to uh, the public to help us with things like this. Yeah, just to follow on, I mean, I think um, we can really attest the global witness to how valuable Aleph is. We, we run our own Aleph uh, internally to store kind of um, data, data that we've uh, we've been given as well as sort of engaging with collaborations uh, with OCCRP via, via their sort of wiki and um, and so forth. And, it, and it's a really, I mean, it's an incredible kind of technology stack that they've they've developed for doing this type of work. And and uh, and Aleph, the OCCRP's Aleph is is just an incredible resource for those who haven't checked it out. I mean, in terms of what Global Witness does to engage um, with citizens more broadly, like I've been very keen as a part of my, my remit of the organization is to make sure that where possible, and obviously it's not always possible given this issues around source protection and so forth, that um, to publish as much data as we can, structured data as we can, because 
you know, we're, we're, we're limited and, and we know that there are many others, many other groups out there that we work for that can, that can take information forward, ide- follow up on leads that we haven't been able to identify and use it to drive the change that we're really keen to see in the world. Um, uh, so so we, are, we, do, we do look at kind of how, how we can kind of publish and host publicly available information um that's at the heart of our that's that's sort of the heart of some of our investigations um and you know we 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 are looking for sort of new routes to sort of engage um engage engage citizens in some of our research but it's it's not something that we've done a great deal of up until now okay thanks a lot yeah there was a lot of interesting information in almost one and a half hour i mean we're a bit earlier ahead of time, but I would like to just uh, also remind everybody that you both filmed a longer video contribution and we have made these available from a special website. So if you want to have a look at those, you can go to uh, our website disruptionlab.org slash evicted video. We will also share the link in the chat. So you'll be also able to see both of their presentations and also a lot more uh, information on all the investigations that were mentioned. And otherwise, of course, also on the websites of either Global Witness and the OCCRP Dubai Golden Sands investigation. And yeah, Sam, if you want to share other uh, links of your research via Twitter, that would be really cool. Or also in our chat, uh, as you prefer. That would be great. Yeah, do both. Um, yeah, so thanks both of you for the really interesting contributions. And also thanks to Rima for the great moderation. Um, and then, oh yeah, we'd just like to say that uh, we hope to see everybody back at the quarter past eight. So we will continue with the Evicted by Greed conference uh, with the live conversation between uh, Friedrich Gerten and Leilani Farha about the documentary Push. And we will also show some short uh, excerpts from the film. So originally, of course, before everything happened around Corona, we wanted to have the film screening as part of the conference. But we decided to move this to a bit later in the year. So we will have an outdoor film screening uh, on the 30th of July at Akut Magnoi. So if you want to see the full film, please join us there. It will be for sure nice and summer, uh, nice weather here in Berlin. And also uh, related to also the work around whistleblowing, we just wanted to mention that we're organizing another outdoor event on the 12th of August, where we will show the documentary Never Whistle Alone. Uh, following a couple of whistleblowers in Italy and the troubles that they face in exposing uh, information. So, yeah, we hope to see you again soon. And now we will have a a short break. So thanks to everybody for joining and uh, see you back at quarter past eight.